Hey guys, hope you're good. Happy Earth Day. I'm going to get into Biden and Johnson's speeches from today, but I want to start with something that came out yesterday. What kind of agreement can we get from Biden G on climate? Uh, I think we're going to see, we are going to see some big announcements from um, some of the G7 economies. Uh, I'll let them uh, unveil those as they come. When somebody says, I'll let them unveil these as they come, that sounds like a top-down operation to me where the boss says, I'll let these individual administrators manage their parts of the pie. Mark Carney was the former governor of the Bank of England for 2013 to 2020. He's now stepped back. He's now the UN Special Envoy. He's one of the key advisors for COP26. And we'll go on to see what else he talks about. The question is about Biden, Xi, USA and China and see what Mark Carney does to the question. Um, it is encouraging that uh, President Xi is part of this summit. It's also encouraging that the uh, private sector is leading the way. And uh, part of what's coming out on the eve of the summit, as you know, is uh, is a big, big announcement uh, from the core of the financial sector. This is a, a critical year for action. There's tremendous momentum now. Uh, we need to uh, reinforce that momentum. And again, having 70 trillion of uh, private capital coming behind net zero, which is what's been announced today, uh, is the type of momentum the world needs. Questions about Xi and Biden. And he, Mark Carney, is talking about his world of finance, understandably, in some ways. But it's easy for me as a cynic, and I think I can afford to be a cynic in this situation, is representing the world of finance that he's still invested in as a partner or vice chair of Brookfield Investments in Canada and the world that he's been leading and responsible for for a lot, large part of his career. 70 trillion is no small number. 70 trillion is the biggest number I've ever seen, actually, in financial terms. The issue is not the amount of money. That 70 trillion is just basically all the money in the world. And of course, it's all going to move there in the end. The question is, when and what do you do in the meantime? And how much of your cake do you have and then eat it? Moving that money by 25 is not the same as moving it by 55. In 55, you're doing it because you're the tail end of the curve and you have to whilst you've been making money in the short term, moving it in the next five years is where the leadership is. We're going to come back to Carney after these speeches, but I thought because his speech came out first and it's quite clear that he knows exactly what's going on, we would start with him. Let's go to Biden's comments from today. I see workers capping hundreds of thousands of abandoned oil and gas wells that need to be cleaned up and abandoned coal mines that need to be reclaimed. The United States sets out on the road to cut a greenhouse gases in half by the end of this decade. It's a quite a visionary speech. He's talking with language of I see, of painting pictures for Americans to get to grips with and also to try and influence other leaders of nations. Scientists tell us that this is the decisive decade. This is the decade we must make decisions that will avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. And this summit is our first step on the road. We'll travel together, God willing, all of us. To and through Glasgow. Glasgow. I mean, I'm not judging the guy, but that's a funny way to say Glasgow. This November, climate change conference. We have to move. We have to move quickly to meet these challenges. This is a moral imperative, an economic imperative, a moment of peril, but also a moment of extraordinary possibilities. We really have no choice. We have to get this done. Okay, so that's Biden. Cut emissions in half by 2030. But it's better than it could be. The question is, how do you actually administrate that? But let's go on to see what Boris says in following comments. We're halfway to, to net zero. We have carbon emissions uh, lower than at any point since the, the 19th century. We're ending support for fossil fuels overseas. Instantly, you can see the difference in narrative position. He's sort of a defensive, accountable administrator rather than a visionary. Even this comment, though, we are cutting support for fossil fuels overseas. When? By when? Time is everything. Cutting support by 2060 is not the same as cutting support next year. As host of COP26, we want to see similar ambitions around the world, from the smallest nations to the biggest emitters, to secure commitments that will keep change to within 1.5 degrees. So they're all agreeing on the same song sheet that we've got to keep it within 1.5 degrees and we've got to make a substantial decline 
this decade by 2030. But this is the key bit here. To secure commitments. What does securing commitments mean and what happens if people don't do them? So we're all kind of agreed on the energy and the momentum and the kind of time frame and that to do it this decade, we need commitments this year, financial and political will. But it's all about the theory for change and what is it that Boris thinks that we need to do in order to do that? To be uh, the scientists uh, and all of our countries to work together uh, to produce the, the technological solutions that humanity is going to need. He says that the scientists need to come together and agree to get the technologies that we need. The scientists already agree. We all understand the frame. And technology isn't the problem. The issue is accountability, literally accounting for the amount of carbon that we put in the sky and the amount of carbon that we put in the ground. This is not a technological intractable problem. This is an issue of accountability or lack thereof. And that lack of accountability comes from the codependent relationship between the financial sector and the political state. And Mark Carney perfectly embodies for me this sort of transatlantic financial character, again, in danger of being cynical and wrong about him. He was in charge of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020, finishes there, puts out a book about value and values, and is now basically the climate czar around the new agreements we're trying to make about the climate right now. If you watch the documentary, The Inside Job from the last financial crisis, 2008, only one small fish got put in prison from the financial sector for leading us down the garden path. We cannot afford to make the same accounting faux pas with our carbon budget because we don't get a second chance to rehabilitate. It's gonna mean the richest nations coming together and exceeding the $100 billion commitment that they already made in 2009. $100 billion in 2009. Compare that to the $70 trillion number that Mark Carney's talking about from the financial sector. As soon as we hear Illion, we're impressed, but it's absolutely pitiful compared to the monstrous claims that the financial sector is making. What President Xi had to say about the harmony uh, with nature was absolutely vital. If we're going to uh, tackle climate change sustainably, we have to deal with the disaster of habitat loss and species loss across our planet. I agree with that. And that's why we're going to be taking this boat trip later in the year up to COP26 to see some of the wildlife that's been getting destroyed and decimated by the behaviours that we're all making. We want to see more examples of governments and private industry working hand in hand as with the newly launched LEAF coalition to reduce deforestation and the multi-trillion dollar uh, Glasgow uh, Financial Alliance uh, for net zero. That's Mark Carney and his group. We've got to be constantly original. We don't need to be original. We don't need to be that inventive. We just need to hold accountable the systems that are currently in play. I'm not saying any of this is going is going to be easy. And there is obviously going to be a political challenge. <laughs> you can say that again. This is not all about uh, some expensive, uh, politically correct green act of, of, of bunny hugging. Uh, or, 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 or however you want to put it. There's nothing wrong with bunny hugging, but I, you, you, you know what I'm driving at, uh, friends and colleagues. Bunny hugging. What on earth is he babbling on about? This is not about greenwashing. It's about bunny. Have you ever heard of bunny hugging? Who hugs a bunny? This is about growth. It's not about growth. When are you going to get? It's not about growth. We can't handle more growth. We've got a distribution issue. We've got an accountability issue. You can only manage what you measure. And we are not currently measuring our carbon emissions properly from the ground up, which is what we need to do if we want to manage it and get it moving in the right direction, not just trusting the global figures, but actually seeing it from the ground up and holding our supply chains accountable. And I think the president was absolutely right uh, to, to stress that. And I, I want to leave you with the thought that uh, we can build back better from this pandemic by building back greener. We need to let go of that metaphor altogether. We need to be thinking about growing, what it means to work in harmony with nature to tend lightly to the garden to grow back a more resilient and more interdependent future not build back something that ultimately is fragile to the world that we're going to find ourselves in let's go to uh, Kunming in october and then glasgow in november armed with ambitious targets and the plans required 
to meet them. For me, the only action that matters at the moment is targeting 100% accountability for all of the carbon molecules that get put in the sky and crediting all of the carbon molecules that get put back in the ground. So we need to be looking at what percentage of each country's emissions are currently being accounted for at a granular level. Just in the same way that on the TV screens right now, we're seeing the corona stats of how many people are getting their first injection and second injection, we need to be measuring and managing what percentage of our estimated carbon expenditure is being granularly accounted for and managed in a specific way. We're able to do it with money. We started just swapping potatoes for cows, and now we've got these very detailed financial models where everything is tracked and on grid, and we're able to get very clear metrics for GDP. We need to do the exact same in a very short amount of time in the carbon sector as well. And let's use this extraordinary moment and the incredible technology that we're working on to make this decade the moment of decisive change. I want to take us back to Mark Carney now to finish. The way monetary policy is operated, the type of collateral that's used, the type of assets that are purchased will be influenced by climate policy. And as a consequence, that will be yet another influence on the pricing of, uh, of security. We've learned uh, through this pandemic that uh, we don't have as resilient uh, economies and societies. I mean, individuals have proven themselves to be resilient to their great credit, but we haven't uh, uh, had the support. We haven't had the protections we need. In the end, the economy needs to move to the future um, and the future, to grossly simplify, is uh, sustainable and digital. So wh whereas we have that support, we also need um, the dynamism and the openness uh, in order to move forward or else we're, we're supporting livelihoods of the past, not, uh, not, not of the future. That, I think, is very um, articulate um, and correct, that the future is ultimately going to be digital and sustainable. Distributed communities of friends who are able to seamlessly do content, commerce, and communication between one another and sustain their lives together. Meanwhile, these historic financial institutions and the nation states are battling to try and find their place in that future picture. My question is, no matter how smart and articulate and no matter how good Mark Carney's book is, after spending his whole career in the financial sector, is he really going to be interested in holding his own friends accountable for their inaction this decade? Is he really going to want to put his own friends in prison for their crimes against humanity? And when I did my Oxford Union debate in November last year, I said that there are three things that we can be doing right now to make sure that we are bringing our oikos nem and our economy and our oikos logos, our ecology into alignment for a thriving future for ourselves. And the first thing is that we can learn from the B Corp movement growing out of small, medium-sized enterprises about what it is to extend our sense of responsibility of our companies beyond just shareholders, the people that own the companies, but to a broader understanding of stakeholders. These banks that are in Mark's G Fans Alliance could make all of their bankers' incentives come into alignment with the Paris Agreement. But the third point is the most important point, and it is the one we just cannot compromise on. And I think that this is what the focus of COP26 should be. We're not sure of momentum. We're not sure of pledges or commitments, as they're called, for the future. What we need is incredibly clear, time-bonded, carbon-measured accountability, globally understood standard for what ecological justice looks like. What happens to you if you're in a position of power and influence and you refuse to hold yourself and your organization to be carbon accountable in a way that we understand to be acceptable? Are we gonna put you in prison? Are we gonna make you have community service? Are we gonna put you in what I think of as a reconnection facility? If you have proven that you're unable to wield influence in the world without disconnecting your organization from that which gives us health and thriving, then we need to put you not a re-correction facility, but a reconnection facility that gets you back into contact with that which makes us thrive so that you lose that pathology and are able to act in a way that supports our health and thriving. Mark Carney may well have had a come to Jesus moment, but until I see him criticize one of his friends, until I see him call for people who act outside of the right accountability to pay the price. The price of carbon per tonne is currently about 
30 to 40 euros a ton. I think the price that should be paid is the future cost. And the future cost is predicated on the idea that if we fail to be accountable, we will go past the 1.5 degrees of heating, which will lead to catastrophic environmental effects. To be able to pay back, to restore that kind of cost, I think the price needs to be paid at no less than $1,000 a ton of carbon or the time in the reconnection facilities to be of an equivalent nature. The next election in 24 and 25 in the UK and the US will be won by the group of people that are able to formulate a clear, coherent and accountable plan for managing what we can measure with carbon and having a clear ecological justice policy to make sure that those with responsibility are accountable. And it is the role of passionate individuals, small operators, small creatives and small businesses on this half of the decade, 21 to 25, to sort our shit out and get our ducks in a row and make sure we're in the right place. So that when we look up to government, to corporations in the second half of this decade, and we're looking to really put, hold their feet to the fire, we can do so knowing that we may not be perfect, we may not have got it right, but we've done what we can to sort our end of the bargain out and there's nowhere for them to hide and we make sure we get ourselves to where we need to at the end of the decade. Guys, take care of yourself. Happy Earth Day. Hope you have a good one. Look after each other and I'll see you soon.